Happy Sabbath to everyone. Today I want to uh, address a subject which is entitled An Immediate Transformation. An Immediate Transformation. First of all, let's open our Bibles to the book of Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And we will read verse 51 to 53. 1 Corinthians 15, 51 to 53. And the Bible tells us, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trump shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Amen. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. End of quote. The Bible is prophesying here an immediate change. This is a change that everyone who will be among the redeemed will experience. Whether you died because you had some particular disease, whether internally or externally, it really is not going to hinder you from having this change. All human beings need to be changed. Because the bodies that we have right now and the minds that we have right now are not what God intended for us. It has deteriorated over the years. After 6,000 years of sin, it is going to be essential for us to experience a change in order to even identify ourselves with the others that God has created in other worlds. We will look like pygmies compared to some of those people. They are all giants in the land, wherever they live. And God is going to bring us up to speed. What sin has done to us, He is going to fix us Amen. in order to bring us back to where we were to be from the beginning. What Adam and Eve were meant to be, was supposed to be passed on to all God's children, all their children. Every single one of us was supposed to be giants mentally, emotionally, physically, spiritually. Every single one of us. But sin has caused so many changes that now we have so much variation in the world. And it continues to get from bad to worse. You know, we haven't seen the worst of human degradation yet. Before Jesus comes on this planet, we are going to see how far human beings could go in their uh, deterioration from sin. We really haven't seen the end of it yet. And we are going to look forward to the change that is brought to view here in 1 Corinthians 15. We're going to look forward to it because by that time we will realize how painful sin can make human lives before the end comes. But this is what is prophesied here in 1 Corinthians 15. The Lord is telling us about uh, what will take place when uh, he decides that he's going to bring about a transformation of the human being. What is now corruptible will become incorruptible. What is now mortal will become immortal. We wouldn't even, we wouldn't even know what sickness is anymore. We wouldn't know what pain is. We will all be strong. How many of you have really suffered from deprivation of sleep? sleep just sleep you didn't get enough sleep don't you feel weak even in your bones sometimes you feel as though you're even hearing things your mind is not even clear much less your poor body and that's just from lack of sleep could you imagine what happens when a person gets some kind of disease 
that makes them permanently weak. Well, sin is going to increase on this planet. And when crime also increases on this planet, a lot of people who do not have the peace of the Lord are going to be deprived of a lot of sleep. See, this is why we have to develop a relationship with the Lord now, because we have to be able to learn how to survive under all circumstances of life, because it is going to get worse before it gets better. And unless we have an experience with the Lord, we, we will suffer much. And I say this with the understanding, brothers and sisters, that it does not have to be that way for God's people. It does not. You know, when we talk about the world is going to get so bad and there'll be so much crime and violence and suffering and sickness, it doesn't have to be that way for the people of God. Psalms 23 talks about the first verse. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Shall not want what? Anything. Anything. When he said I shall not want, he meant that the Lord was indeed his provider of all things. That's the experience all of us must have. We must be able to say that first verse of the psalm with such authority even in the time of trouble. And especially in the time of trouble. Because the Lord is willing to reveal himself to us in ways that we cannot imagine. But one of the things that will be experienced when the it is all said and done, is that there will be an immediate transformation of the human being. Our bodies will be changed. Those who are slow and weak and maybe deformed at the present time, all of that is gone. You will be like newborn babes, even though you may be still of the consciousness of the adult that you are, you will be all spring and ready to go every day of the week for all the weeks of eternity for the rest of forever. That's what God has promised and it is going to be an immediate change. No evolution here. No evolving for years and years and years to become like God. It is going to be an immediate change. Thank God. Let's go to Daniel chapter 4. And we'll see another change that was somewhat immediate. Very short period of time. Daniel chapter 4, and look at verse 33. Daniel chapter 4, and look at verse 33. The Bible tells us, The same hour was the thing fulfilled upon Nebuchadnezzar, and he was driven from men and did eat grass as oxen. And his body was wet with the dew of heaven, till his hairs were grown like eagle's feathers and his nails like bird's claws. Imagine this transformation taking place with a human being. In the same hour that the declaration was made, everything started to happen. You know in these horror movies when you see some, some werewolf being transformed, that's basically what happened to him. He just started to change. In a moment, things started to happen. Hair started to grow, and nails started to change form, and uh, he became like an animal eating grass, a human being. For that to happen, brothers and sisters, that means his heart had to change. His mind, in other words, had to be changed. He was no longer able to reason like a human being, he was thinking like an animal. That's right. So he was acting like an animal. Remember, thoughts are what really starts the process that leads up to actions. And his thought processes changed, so his actions began to change. 
But this was under divine intervention. God did this to him. You know why God did this to him? Pride. How many of us are proud? How many of us are too proud? We allow ourselves to be controlled by the carnal heart instead of thinking our way on to transformation. In cooperating with God, God will work to change us. But many times we just giving to the carnal way of thinking. And as a result, we are stuck in a rut of being so self-centered as Nebuchadnezzar was. Look at verse 29, coming down to verse 33 again. At the end of 12 months, he, referring to Nebuchadnezzar, walked in the palace of the kingdom of Babylon. The king spake and said, Is not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of the kingdom by the might of my power and for the honor of my majesty? Notice how many times he promotes himself. While the word was in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven saying, O king Nebuchadnezzar, to thee it is spoken, the kingdom is departed from thee, and they shall drive thee from men, and thy dwelling shall be with the beast of the field. They shall make thee to eat grass as oxen, and seven times, meaning seven years, shall pass over thee, until thou know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men, and giveth it to whom he will. In other words, God was saying, I am the one responsible for making you who you are and giving you what you have. Do we see him that way? Do we see God that way? Or do we think it is because we are so intelligent that we make money and that we are able to achieve the various goals that we set in life is because of who we are? Well, that's exactly how Nebuchadnezzar viewed it, just like you and I often find ourselves doing. And we need to stop it. We need to stop it for our own good. Because even those who do not serve God and are successful in life, it is as a result of the grace of God. Yes. And Nebuchadnezzar may not have been serving God as he ought at that time, but God blessed him and God gave him enough evidence that it was because of his divine intervention and still this brother decided to take the glory upon himself. Don't we ever? So there are things written in the word of God that we don't always take seriously. But when we look at the immediate change that took place to this brother, it should bring us to our senses. It should bring us to our senses. Because to get God on the wrong side of us, because he has given us enough of his word to know of his, his intervention, his will, and we still decide to go and look and view things in our own way, he can do to us exactly what he did to Nebuchadnezzar, brothers and sisters. He can. Don't put it behind God to bring us to our senses through drastic measures sometimes when it becomes necessary because we've gone too far. This was one occasion when Nebuchadnezzar did go too far and the Lord stopped him in his tracks dead in his tracks and I venture to say he can do the very same to you and I so we need to be very careful how far we go in the exalting of ourselves because we see here that God can make immediate changes even to the mind not just to the body we saw what will happen when Jesus returns He's going to totally transform our bodies. We're going to have incorruptible or immortal bodies. But we see in the example with Nebuchadnezzar, he can do the same thing to our minds. He can change our minds in a moment. In a moment. Now we looked at Nebuchadnezzar's mind changing in a negative way. Isn't God capable of changing it in a positive way too? Yes. 
in a moment. Yes. yes, he is capable of that. In the book, Patriarchs and Prophets, Ellen White was commenting on the tragedy that befell Joseph after his brothers had taken him captive and bound him and sold him to the merchants because they didn't like their brother. Sometimes we don't like people and we wish them harm. Mm -hmm. Well, in this situation, Joseph's brothers acted out their dislike for Joseph. Sold him. You ever thought of selling your, your sibling? <laughs> to get rid of them? They did it. They acted it out. But you know, it may sound cruel, but this was the beginning of Joseph's transformation. That very tragedy that befell Joseph actually saved Joseph's life. Ellen White in Patriarchs and Prophets, reading from page 213 to 214, 213 to 214 of Patriarchs and Prophets, we read, then his thoughts, now this is when Joseph was now finding himself in a situation where he couldn't help himself. He now knew he was going to be a slave. He was now away from the security of his father who babied him and spoiled him. And now he was without hope for the future. And listen to what now remember we said it how all the changes, whether good or bad, begin with the thoughts. Listen to this. Then his thoughts, that's Joseph's thoughts, turned to his father's God. In his childhood he had been taught to love and fear him. Often in his father's tent he had listened to the story of the vision that Jacob saw as he fled from his home, an exile and a fugitive. He had been told of the Lord's promises to Jacob and how they had been fulfilled. How in the hour of need, the angels of God had come to instruct, comfort, and protect him. And he had learned of the love of God in providing for men a redeemer. Now, all these precious lessons came vividly before him. Now, in this very moment of his tragedy, all these thoughts all of a sudden comes to him. Joseph believed that God, even the God of his fathers, would be his God. He then and there gave himself fully to the Lord. And he prayed that the keeper of Israel will be with him in the land of his exile. His soul thrilled. Now remember he was just in a depressed state. You want to talk about depression? This brother had lost all hope. But his thoughts, he decided to channel his thoughts in a different direction. And in the process of doing so, of course, the Holy Spirit was helping to bring to his attention things that he had learned about God before. And now he began to determine that he was going to believe in that God that he heard about. And notice, and he prayed that the keeper of Israel will be with him in the land of the exile. His soul thrilled with the high resolve or decision to prove himself true to God. Under all circumstances, to act as became a subject of the king of heaven. He would serve the Lord with undivided heart. Now this is... These are the decisions he was making in that moment, brethren. Mm -hmm. He would serve the Lord with undivided heart. He would meet the trials of his lot with fortitude. That means strength. It doesn't mean weakness and vacillating. No. He would serve the Lord with, the, with undivided heart. He would meet the trials of his lot with fortitude and perform every duty with fidelity. One day's experience 
had been the turning point in Joseph's life. Its terrible calamity had transformed him from a petted child to a man, thoughtful, courageous, and self-possessed. That means he was going to bring himself under control. That means as his thoughts would wander, he made up his mind he was going to bring it back to serve the Lord faithfully. When did you do that? When did you make that resolve? When did you resolve to do that? When did you purpose within your heart to serve the Lord that way? Brother, sister, think about it. And when did you stop? If you did. Have you ever made the decision that he made? That you resolve, you decide in yourself that you are going to serve this God, that you believe in the God that you heard about or read about, and that you believe enough to obey. That you are determined within yourself that you're going to serve that God faithfully to the end, that you will give him your whole heart, and that you will not do it in a weak manner. Every time you saw that challenge to your decision, you were going to stand firm to ensure that you maintained your resolution. When did you do that? Because I'll tell you something, the day Joseph made that decision, he maintained a consistent resolve to keep it. Have you? You know, we say when we are baptized that how I decided to serve the Lord. Okay, you made the decision. How strong was that decision? And every time that was challenged, how many times have you maintained your resolve, your decisiveness in regards to what you said at the baptism you were going to do. Do you know that that's what Joseph did at that point? In a moment he got the vision and he made a decision along with it. It wasn't some dreamy kind of vision, it was an understanding. The Lord gave him an understanding that, look, you need me. And as he started to consider the God that his father told him about, just like our parents tell us about God since we were kids, we were being told, or we heard stories about God. When did we make the decision to serve him faithfully all the days of our lives? This is what this brother did. We sometimes wonder why it is our religion is not as effective as the religion of the men and women that we read about in the Bible. This is the reason why. Because we don't make the kind of decisions that they made and we don't maintain a consistent allegiance to our decision as they did. And not until we do so, brothers and sisters, will our lives be changed completely changed because this was a transformation in a moment. His thoughts changed, his purpose in life changed, his decision as to how he was going to deal with anything that came against him changed and he maintained it. And what was the result? Genesis 39. Let's go to Genesis 39. And let's read from verse 2 to 6. Genesis 39, reading from 2 to 6. And the Lord was with Joseph, and he was a prosperous man. And he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. And his master saw that the Lord was with him. 
and that the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand. And Joseph found grace in his sight, and he served him, and he made him overseer over his house, and all that he had he put into his hand. And it came to pass from the time that he had made him overseer in his house, and over all that he had, that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. And the blessing of the Lord was upon all that he had in the house and in the field. And he left all that he had in Joseph's hand. And he knew not aught he had. In other words, he wasn't even aware of how much his possessions were multiplying and how much he had accumulated as a result of the blessings of God. He didn't even know, he didn't even care. Why? Notice, and he knew not what he had, save the bread which he did eat. And Joseph was a goodly person and well favored. When the Bible said in verse 2, and the Lord was with Joseph, it means a lot more than just the Lord being present with him. The Lord was basically backing him up. You know, we use phrases like, you don't worry, I'll watch your back. That means taking care of you. The Lord was not just there with Joseph. He was taking care of Joseph. He was blessing Joseph. Why? Because Joseph had resolved to serve the Lord faithfully to the end. And it wasn't just a resolution with nice wording. It wasn't just, well, I will serve the Lord. But you have no idea how you're going to do it. Have you done that? Have you said you'll serve the Lord, but you don't know how? Or maybe your way of serving the Lord is that I'll go to church every Sabbath. I'll read my Bible every day. But what about all the other affairs of life that involve God? Involves God. Have you decided to serve the Lord even in those things, in those circumstances of life? Well, that's what Joseph did. When you go back and you read what Joseph had decided, he had decided that anything that came, he was not going to have a divided mind. He would be faithful or his fidelity will be sure insofar as serving his father's God is concerned. Because he believed this God, and he was prepared to serve this God in the way in which he knew that this God wanted him to live. Now I want to give you an illustration of what that really meant to Joseph. I want you to see the practical application of the resolution that he made. That decision he made, I want you to have a little idea. Because I want us, brothers and sisters, I want us to be like Joseph. You know, Joseph, just like Isaac, and in some instances David, were actually types of Christ. And when you see what these brothers were like under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, they are, the Lord has written these things in his word to illustrate to us what we could be like. So sometimes, you know, we don't want to just look at the story from the outside. We want to look at the story from the inside. What went on in these brothers' minds? What is it they were thinking? What, what, what made them do what they did? What kind of persons they were on the inside? I want to give you an illustration of how he applied his resolution. Same book, Patriarchs and Prophets, but this time I'm reading from page 228. Patriarchs and Prophets, 228, paragraph 2. Arriving in Egypt, Joseph was sold to Potiphar. Now remember, he has already made this resolution. It was along the way, as I said, it was in a moment. 
that he was changed. Listen, <laughs> arriving in Egypt, Joseph was sold to Potiphar, captain of the king's guard, in whose service he remained for 10 years. He was here exposed to temptations of no ordinary character. Are you hearing that? This is a big boy in the Egyptian army. So he had access to every and any kind of stuff. So what Joseph was exposed to wasn't any ordinary stuff, including the temptations. He was here exposed to temptations of no ordinary character. He was in the midst of idolatry. The worship of false gods was surrounded by all the pomp of royalty, supported by the wealth and culture of the most highly civilized nation then in existence. Yeah. So he was surrounded by a lot of stuff. <coughs> Yet Joseph preserved, listen to this now, despite all the material things and the moral stuff and the idolatrous exposure and all that sort of stuff, we are told, yet Joseph preserved his simplicity and his fidelity to God. So with all the stuff going on around him, he didn't try to fit in to be in his pompous appearance like everybody else around him. He maintained his simplicity, but also his fidelity or faithfulness to God. The sights and sounds of vice were all about him. But he was as one, listen to this, he was as one who saw and heard not. Are you that way? When you're surrounded by evil in all its different forms, do you see it or you don't? Do you hear it or you do? For us to be told that Joseph was as one who saw and heard not, that means Joseph was not focusing on it. How could you not focus on something that's right in your face? Decisions. Decisions. Either you're going to gloss over it you, 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 you're just soaking it in, or you're going to just make sure that you're not going to take it in at all. You're about your business. You're about your father's business. You think you could do that? Mm -hmm. Do you think you can see and not see and hear and not hear? Brothers and sisters, if Joseph could have done it, so can we. You know you could be looking at something but not seeing it because you're not looking at it long enough to take it in. You're not allowing it to register because the first glimpse that you get that it is something that could destroy your soul, you decide you're going to turn your eye in the other direction. That is seeing and not seeing. Basically, you got a hint and you decided, uh -uh, this is not for my God to see me indulging, so I'm about my father's business. This is not for my God that I'm hearing coming, uh-uh. You over here, I'm over there. That was Joseph. Why? He had already made a decision. He was going to serve his God, have you? You know, we think we have just because we say we accept Jesus. You accept Jesus? But do you accept Jesus' requirements for service? You accept him into your heart for what reason? If it is you're not going to allow him to have your cooperation in preserving your heart. Note, his thoughts were not permitted to linger upon forbidden subjects. The desire to gain the favor of the Egyptians could not cause him to conceal his principles. In other words, he wasn't trying to fit in and pretend as though, well, you know, I'm, I'm one of you all. It's okay. You don't have to finger me out. You know, I'm not a sore thumb, different from everybody else. 
he was not afraid. You know why? He had one purpose. He had already made up his mind that he was going to serve his father's God. And he didn't care who was watching him. He was serving his father's God whether they saw it or not. And they certainly did because he didn't hide it. He didn't hide it. And he was not a loud mouth. He wasn't trying to, well, you know, I'm serving Jehovah. You can serve your idols. No, it was, a jo- it was about how he went about it, brothers and sisters. He was serving Jehovah in his heart. He was all about, no, 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 this is not going to please my God, so I'm not going to please myself with it. I'm, I'm on the way. This was Joseph's decision from the beginning, and he was living up to his decision. This is what makes the difference between us and those who the Lord saw fit to record in the Bible. The desire to gain the favor of the Egyptians could not cause him to conceal his principles. Had he attempted to do this, he would have been overcome by temptation. But he was not ashamed of the religion of his fathers, and he made no effort to hide the fact that he was a worshiper of Jehovah. Amen. End of quote. Isn't it nice (laughs) when you take the time to understand the mind of a saint? Because we have different ideas of what a saint is like (coughs) until the Lord opens it up to us. That's why we're so blessed with the gift of the spirit of prophecy. Because the Holy Spirit could show us these things if we didn't have the spirit of prophecy and we were just reading from the Bible, but it has taken the time. God is so good. He has taken the time to open it up for us so that we can build on what God already showed to his servant Ellen White. We are able to look inside of the mind of a man who served God faithfully after being transformed in a moment. We think we can't change. We have to have years before we get to where he was in one day. That's what we think. Years before I could really be a Christian. Years before I could really start walking the straight and narrow path for the rest of forever. No, it does not necessitate years. Don't fool yourself. It has to do with your choice. It has to do with the decision you make as to when you are really going to serve God. You could fool people for as long as you think that you are a Christian. Oh yes, they, yeah, they, they know I'm a Christian because I do Christian things. I feed the poor and I, and I, and I go and I, and I give my tithe and I, I, yeah, oh, he's a Christian. But what about the inside? If we open up the head and we get to see the thoughts on the inside, when the challenges, when the, when the sins When the evils confront them, are they a Christian still? Do they act like a Christian in your absence? When nobody's around but you? And the temptations? And God? Are we still Christian? That's why the Lord was able to do for Joseph what he did. God was with Joseph. Basically, he began to have the experience that Enoch had. God walked with him. And he didn't walk with him just to keep him company. He walked with him to bless him. And that's why the scripture said that he prospered in everything that he did. And it was not a prosperity based upon the fact that he was accumulating wealth. This brother was of such an experience that he was blessing and became a blessing to his master. Everything he touched turned to gold, so to speak. Why? Because God was pleased, pleased with the service of this brother who had made up his mind to give him everything. Why can't we do that? Why shouldn't we do that? Why why shouldn't the Lord really compare us with these brothers who did it while we are saying, well, you know, I just don't have it in me. 
I don't know how they did it. You know how they did it? They made a decision and they depended on the Lord for the help to maintain their decision. That's how they did it. It wasn't some mystery. Unlike Nebuchadnezzar, in other words, Joseph did not allow pride or opportunity to make him lose sight of his commitment. Remember Potiphar's wife? That was most probably one of the biggest challenges he may have had. How did he deal with it? The same way he dealt with every other temptation that came to him. He, he, it was what he saw and what he heard was like if it wasn't even there. Once he recognized it was to lead him away from his fidelity to his God. So, you know the privileges that would have been opened up to him if he went along with Potiphar's wife? That was the master's wife. But he said no. And you remember his words? How can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? He had his focus, brothers and sisters, was really just to please God. But you see, that Tests came to him after he had already passed other tests. He was already developing a certain habit in his life in regards to how he would deal with anything that wasn't right in the sight of God. Do you know that for those of us who receive the seal of God in these last days, Ellen White makes it clear that there must not be one stain of sin on our characters. So when are we going to make the decision? When are we going to make the decision or resolve to serve the Lord with all our heart? Not a divided heart, all our heart. When will we make the decision? I don't I, I don't need to hear about your baptism decision. I want to hear about your decision to serve God. The real one. When are you going to make it? Because not until you make that decision are you safe. Not until we, because you know why? Because death is not foreign to us. We can pass away anytime. But when you make the decision the Lord is able to watch over you in a way because you become extremely valuable to his cause as Joseph became at that point. God knew what was going to happen to his people and he needed an instrument to operate through in order to bless his people at a time when a time of trouble was going to come upon them because it was coming. What the, children, what the Hebrews experienced, what the children of God experienced, was a time of trouble such as never was for them. And it came shortly after because a new king arose as the Pharaoh of Egypt who knew not Joseph's God. And he did not like the Hebrews. That's why we read now in history about the, the difficult time they had as slaves under these new pharaohs. But God had prepared a way for his people to find blessings ahead of that persecution time. And he used Joseph because Joseph was truly faithful in his service to God. Who is he going to use today? How many of us are going to prepare ourselves that we could receive the seal of God? He's not going to put a seal of, on, on us unless we make the kind of commitment that Joseph did. And he doesn't need just one individual alone. He's looking for a people that will make that decision because his seal has to be placed upon a people that he could send throughout the length and breadth of the earth to represent him. Not just one individual. Joseph was just going out into Egypt and he was, God was going to use Egypt as the place to pave the way for his people to, to get ready. But now he has to prepare his people all over the world. 
and he needs some of us that he could rely upon. So brothers and sisters, we have to get to know God. We have to get to know God. And like Joseph, we have to believe in that God. It's not just a matter of knowing about God. We have to believe God. Because if we do not have that experience of getting to know God and believing in God, we are not going to put our total dependence upon him in the face of our present challenges, nor in, this, in, the, in, in the face of the challenges that are yet to come. And we're living in a time where we're seeing the world is changing. Our nation is changing. And we have some serious stuff coming up. People are changing. And they're changing towards those who want to hold on to the traditional form of Christianity. It's a new form of Christianity that is coming to the forefront in this world. People are seeing what they consider to be love in an entirely different light to what the Bible's interpretation of love is. And anybody who doesn't see it their way, they consider you to be a hater. So we need to get to know God. <laughs> we need to get to know God and we need to be able to have an experience with him like Joseph so that we can have the assurance that he will be with us as we find ourselves deeper down in Egypt. Look at Romans chapter 3. Romans 3 verse 21 to 26. The Bible declares, Romans chapter 3, 21 to 26. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe. For there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Whom God had set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood. To declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. To declare I say at this time his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Brethren, we're now living in a time when we can experience righteousness by faith. I mean becoming righteous because of our faith. That is not because of our works that we end up being acceptable in the sight of God, but because of Jesus' righteousness, which we believe we receive by faith. Sounds like a whole lot of words, but hopefully with the help of the Holy Spirit, you'll, you'll follow what I'm saying. We looked at Nebuchadnezzar changing into an animal in a moment. We looked at huma human beings who were faithful in the end, being transformed even physically in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, the Bible said. You blink your eye and you are, you, you are a different person. Incorruptible, immortal. In a moment, you blink and, and, and you are different. And we are saying that we're serving that same God. And he's telling us that according to our faith be done unto us. If I have that faith to believe, that though I am a sinner right now, that in a moment I could become a saint. Think about it. That's the God we serve. That I believe that I could receive Christ's righteousness because mine just can't make it. But if I believe as I confess my sins 
and I resolve to stay away from them in his strength, not in my human efforts, but in the strength of the Lord, I determine that I am going to do like Joseph, that I am going to serve the Lord after I receive his righteousness. I immediately get that righteousness that Jesus has. But I don't just get the white garment of his beautiful character. I also possess the power that he possessed to enable me to live obediently. The only way, however, we've got to understand this part. The only way, however, I will be able to manifest the perfection in good works that he was able to do is if I decide or choose to do his will all the time. Because the Spirit is in us now. We believe, we receive, we confess, we put away that old man and we take on Christ by faith. It's all a matter of our trusting and believing. We put on Christ by faith. We have his righteousness. We no longer see ourselves clothed in filthy rags. We have it and now that spirit is working in us because we believe and he's telling us this is the way walking in it and we now have the opportunity to decide yes or no. And we make the choice. Once I make that choice to obey or comply with the spirit, then that righteousness that I have received through justification becomes imparted onto me. It's no longer just imputed. It now becomes imparted because I have agreed to comply with the movings of the spirit. And that is now being imparted onto me as I agree and I make those efforts to comply the Spirit gives me the power to obey and I do that and I begin the process of sanctification. I am now beginning to literally change because I am cooperating with the process of justification. All I had to do was decide like Joseph did. Choose like Joseph did and make those efforts like Joseph did and the spirit and power is released to me to obey and keep the righteousness that I have received through justification. That's why inspiration tells us that sanctification is really justification retained. We retain it because we keep agreeing to comply with it, to comply with its demands. We know what God wants. That's what we decide we're going to give him. That's what Joseph did every day, every moment of the day, with every choice, every decision he had to make. What about you and I? You think we have any excuse in the judgment when others have done it before us? The sooner we decide that we are going to do what the Lord said, like they did, the sooner we become true saints. Saints are not dead people that others worship. Saints are living beings that worship God in spirit and in truth. They truly comply with God's will because they surrender their wills to His all the time. That's a saint. And we all could be. It's given to us that privilege, that opportunity, every single moment of every day we are given the privilege of becoming like Christ. After receiving him, he now is willing to impart those characteristics into our being. It is infused into us once we make the choice or the decision to comply with his will. Is that is that so complicated? God has made it simple enough for us to understand. 
that this is a free gift. We start off with it free and we end up with it free. All is required is for us to cooperate. Look at again at what verse 24 said. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. It's free. We don't have to pay for it. That's why, that's why salvation is open to all human beings. No, no money is required. Even the poor man can attain to it. And that's why many times in the scriptures the Lord used poor people to be his servants. Because he wanted to prove that it is possible to all men. So we need to put on Christ in truth. Not just be talking Jesus talk. Not because you know the Bible, it means that you are a Bible believer. You could know the information just like the devil also knows and trembles. But he's no Christian. Because he does not choose God's will. He does not decide to do God's will. But when we do it, we make distance with him. We, we separate ourselves from him by miles. With all the power he has, he can't catch up with us. Because when we are filled with the spirit of the Lord, when we have the righteousness of Christ, the devil also looks at us with fear. But it's up to us to maintain it. You know what it requires? Consistency in doing right. Consistency in choosing right. Because that's where it all begins. It all begins with our thoughts and the choices that we make in small things as well as in large things. It just requires of us to do like Joseph and choose the right thing. And we do that all the time. And we are okay. We don't have to worry about whether we're going to be saved. Because we know our salvation is really dependent upon our relationship with Christ. Do I believe I have him? Do I believe he's mine? Do I believe he has imputed his righteousness unto me? Do I believe I still have it? Am I keeping it by cooperating with him in maintaining his will and in utilizing the power that he makes available to me when I receive him by faith? Yes. Once I am making that earnest effort and I am maintaining that faith, we will grow. That's why we are told we grow from faith to faith. I want to share a statement with you from the book Ministry of Healing. Ministry of Healing, page 351. And I'm reading from paragraph 1. Ministry of Healing, 351. And paragraph 1. It is by the youth and children of today that the future of society is to be determined. And what these youth and children shall be depends upon the home. Isn't that what we saw happen in the case of Joseph? Yeah, that's what happened. God was able to pave the way for his people because he had a father who was working on a son or him on his sons at home. And Joseph was complying. And it made all the difference later on when he was disconnected from his father and from his home. So I'm going to read it again. It is by the youth and children of today that the future of society is to be determined. And what these youth and children shall be depends upon the home. Listen to this now. This, this was a shocker to me. To the lack of right home training may be traced the larger share of the disease and misery and crime that curse humanity. I'm going to read that over and, and see if you grasp this. 
to the lack of right home training may be traced the larger share of the disease and misery and crime that curse humanity. In other words, you see all the crime we have in the world today? All the misery, all the disease, inspiration is saying that the greater blame is as a result of a lack of home training. Mm -hmm. Why we have all this trouble in the world today. Yeah. If the home life were pure and true, mm -hmm. if the children who went forth from its care were prepared to meet life's responsibilities mm -hmm. and dangers like Joseph, what a change will be seen in the world. Do you see why the Lord had to separate his people, the Huguenots, and put them in mountain places with their children to prepare them for what they were about to face? Brothers and sisters, we don't realize how important it is the contribution we make in training children and young people, even today. When we do it right, we are actually contributing to the decrease in the disease the diseases of the present world in which we live. We are actually contributing to the, to the reducing of misery. And we also contribute in cutting back on crime. Home training. All of those areas are affected by home training. But you know, one of the things that was extremely important in what we studied concerning Joseph is that Joseph learned to be consistent. I think many of us have not learned the importance of consistency, of sticking to our plan. We say we're going to serve God, but when trouble comes, we change our minds. And then we get relief and we change our minds again because the peace is there. Each and every one of us have a part to play in helping one another to really move forward in a consistent manner. You can't be one way today and another day to way tomorrow. You can be one way one minute and another way the next minute. You have to be consistent. Joseph was consistent. And what did the Lord do? He blessed him. You think he wouldn't do that for us? Brothers and sisters, you think he wouldn't do that for us? We have to learn that when we make up our minds that we're going to serve the Lord, even if we did not get, don't blame your parents now, even if we did not get the upbringing that we read about in the law and the testimony, we are now big men and women, most of us. What are we doing with our training, our personal training? Didn't you hear inspiration said that Joseph became a man? He learned to control himself. He learned to control himself. You know how? He learned to control his mind. Yeah. He learned to control his thoughts. Repeated thoughts results in repeated actions. If you, if you keep repeating the same thoughts over and over again, or the same words over and over again, it will result in the same actions over and over again. 
So sometimes when you see your actions are wrong, you need to change the thoughts and the words so that the actions will change. But you have to be consistent. You want to bend a tree? You can't be letting it go all the time and then pulling it and then letting it go. You have to bend the tree and hold it right there. Make sure it doesn't go back and then you bend it a little more. It mightn't be very hard, but it will be a consistent one direction that you're going in all the time. Amen. Until that tree ends up getting the message and it can't grow in, in any other direction. So brothers and sisters, you've got to bend your tree. You and my tree, personally, we have to become more consistent than we are in training ourselves in the way of the Lord. Joseph did it, and you know what? He didn't have his father around to help him, but he had God. And he made sure that as the challenges came, he did the same thing over and over again. Same thing over and over again until he got it into his bones that when the big test came to him, he was the same person. Even his, his master recognized that God was with this young man. Even his master, he gave him everything to take care of. He didn't even think about his own business anymore. He knew that it was in good hands. He could even trust him with all the wealth that he had. He knew he wasn't going to steal it because he saw the consistency. Do people see that in us? Do people see us different Christians from day to day depending on the circumstances of life? How are we going to influence them? You know what they often say? We play church. Why? Because they see us in church when we are in church. And they see us not church people when we're not in church. We have to be consistent. And it all boils down to our thoughts. What choices or decisions we make on a consistent basis is the same thing we have to pass on to our children. A consistent set of right directions. Just like they must learn to make right choices consistently is the same thing for us. Don't, don't put it just upon the children and the youth. Inspiration has given us an idea of what we have created. The world that exists today is what we have created. Mm -hmm. Not just our parents, we. We have created the crime, the disease, the misery. Because once we contribute in the wrong direction, we are contributing to humanity's suffering. So the day has to come, like Joseph, that we make a choice or a decision to change. And when we make that choice or decision, it needs to be consistent. It cannot be a double-minded man being unstable in all his ways kind of decision. The Lord is looking for the Joseph type of decisions that are, are consistent and not afraid if who or wherever we are and what people think or say, we are going to serve the Lord no matter what. When God could get those kind of people, we'll see the world come to an end. I want to close with Romans 1.17. Romans 1.17. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. <coughs> from faith to faith. It shows us that faith is a growing thing. We build on what we have. We don't decrease on it lest we find ourselves always going backwards and starting all over again. We build on the faith that we have. That's what Joseph did from faith to faith. Every new challenge that came to him, he, he dealt with it the same way. He was going to serve the Lord faithfully, and he did exactly that. So what choices are you planning to make in the next 24 hours that you know are wrong choices? 
Oh, I'm in a hurry for the Sabbath to be over. For what? <laughs> what plans do you have that are not in harmony with God's will? Change them. Change them now. Make up your mind that you're going to serve the Lord faithfully because you still have time to change them. You know, Ellen White said, if you're walking down the aisle and you realize that you're making a wrong decision, even though you uh, have already made the promise to marry this person, she said, change it. Yes, sir. I mean, walking down the aisle. You know how much money has been spent? You know how many plans have been made? You know how many people have been already invited? Change it. Amen. If you know it is wrong. That's how important decision making is. It can make you or break you. Your life could be a blessing or it could be hell on earth based upon a wrong or a right decision. May God help us, brothers and sisters, to realize that Christianity is not a game. It is a real thing and that God really wants us to be saved. And the beauty of the Christian experience is that we can be transformed in a moment. Don't get caught up with the, and it's a, it's a true saying that sanctification is a lifelong thing. Well, I'm not dealing here with just sanctification. I'm dealing here with justification. Amen. And justification, that experience it's a momentary one. It's all based upon our faith. And when we get the experience, it is up to us now to build on it. Faith upon faith upon faith until we become totally transformed for eternity. May God help us to this effect and may we use Joseph's experience as an example of what we all could experience. And do not become discouraged because the Lord is able to solve every problem of our lives if we allow him to do so. If we would only believe that what he has done for others, he could do for us. But he needs our cooperation. He needs our choices. He needs our decisions. And we can make a decision today that will actually change our lives for the rest of eternity.